Good morning and welcome to University Heights Baptist Church Online. Uh, we're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Um, even though we're worshiping in different locations, maybe in our homes, maybe sitting on our couch or, or at the breakfast table or whatever, uh, we're glad that we can worship God together. Now we want this to be kind of like um, how, we, how we worship at, at church when we're all together. Uh, we don't want you to just sit and watch a video, but we want you to participate. So here in a moment when we sing, sing along with us. Uh, when we give our tithes and offerings, give as much as God is leading you to give. Uh, when Miles reads the, the, the scripture, open your Bible and read along with him. All right, we want, we want this to be where we're all interacting together and, and we're all giving our praise to God because he's worth it and he deserves it. So we love you. Thanks again for joining us today. Let's continue in singing and in worship. Now is time for children's message with Miss Abby, um, and I just keep thinking back to all of our um, 8 p.m. sort of uh, Facebook Live sessions that we've had this week. I'm so glad that you guys have been uh, joining to listen to a bedtime story that will continue um, for the rest of this week as well. Um, so I just I'm grateful that you guys have taken time to tune in, and if not, you can go back to our uh, kids Facebook page to to review those and kind of get those uh, cozy for your bedtime um, stories. But it also makes me think how much I love books. And I thought about this too because um, Taylor Edwards um, posted on Facebook about Elena needing more books. She's she's read all the books in the home, and and you know books are great ways to take us different places and help us learn and read and and really um, use our reading brain, which is really important to do while we're away from school. And Elena's run out of books, so Taylor was asking for people to send books for um, the, the grade level where she reads and asking for more books to read. And then, and then I got to thinking, well, you know, I remember a lot of sweet books that were given to me um, by people that I know and that I love, and um, some especially that are no longer here with us. Um, I specifically think of uh, this book that comes to mind. Uh, it says, Are You My Mother? Um, I love this book. And if you noticed, um, it's had some life. You see, there's edging has happened. Um, there's been tape put on the spine. This was my dad's um, beginning reader, Dr. Seuss book. Um, my grandma Smith recently passed away. She was 99 years old, um, and I miss her very much. Um, but I know we'll see her again, and she's in a um, she's in a better place, which is is good news and gives us. Um, hope and restoration in Jesus. But I come and think about this book too because, you know, it's lived some life. 
you know, it's been passed down. It has my dad's name, Randy Smith, right there, you know. And there's the pages are kind of worn and the spine's frayed. And some of the pages are still kind of in good condition. But you kind of flip through and, like, you know, see the spines coming undone. And some of the pages are actually torn. This is like Trey's nightmare. He's a, he's a connoisseur of books and he likes to keep them in good condition. But there's been life that's happened to these books. They've been read. They've been used to love on kids by reading it to them, um, by snuggling up in a rocker and reading um, good night stories, um, with turning on a fan at night um, when it's hot in the summer, um, and listening to your grandparents or your mom or someone read to you a sweet book. Um, that's a sweet memory to have. And so books can give us sweet memories. Books can give us um, a, a way to remember someone specific. Um, but also, even though the, there's been some life that's happened to this book, my cousins and I and other people in our family have read this book, and so it's gotten good use. You know, other times I think of other books that have been given to me in, like, almost perfect condition. Um, this book was given to me by June Brown, um, by Ted, Ted Brown. Um, we love Ted and June. Uh, they are no longer with us, and they are at home with Jesus. Um, but you see her beautiful handwriting right there. June Brown, done in cursive, very beautiful. Um, and, and her book that she gave me, um, Ted gave actually to me whenever Harlow was born. And he actually wrote a sweet note to Harlow and put in it um, at our uh, baby shower at church, which was sweet. Um, but she read this to her students. And you can tell the condition of this book is, you know, pretty pristine. June was a pretty pristine lady herself. Um, so, you know, she made sure all the kids handled it with care. She kept it in a special um, bookshelf and a, a book section in her home to make sure all of her school books were taken care of. Um, and Ted always said she, she wanted other teachers to have this book. And I felt honored that he gave the book Corduroy, one of her favorites, um, to me to have for Harlow and I to read together. Um, and so books are special. Um, we know that the ultimate book that is the most special is the Bible. And the Bible points us to Jesus in, in every story. We've, we've been learning about that in our bedtime stories that we've been doing each night. Every story of the Bible points us to Jesus. And that's exciting. But then I kind of think of, you know, there's books that have been lived life. And then there's books that also have been life, but maybe not as harshly. Um, and... It's interesting, both of these have been restored though. When you think of the word restored, you kind of think of it meaning um, taking something old and making it new. But, you know, this book lived a lot of life and my grandma Smith restored it by keeping the spine together. You know, it's restored and it's, you know, taped down and all the, the spine has actually stayed together and all the pages are still in here and accounted for. So this book has been restored. And then you also think about this book that Ted gave me from June, which is so sweet to me. And it's in actually excellent condition, but he restored it to a new home, which was interesting too, that restoration can happen in many ways. But the best restoration is what comes to the restoration of Jesus. Um, this morning we're going to be learning about how God restores our soul um, and specifically how God um, did that through Jesus uh, through a man named Peter on a shore. Um, it's a very sweet story and that's a reference we're going to have uh, today in service. Um, but God takes people, no matter their condition, um, and restores their soul through the blood and power of Jesus, not by anything we have done but because Jesus is the one who restores us. When God sees us and we accept Jesus into our heart, God does not see us. He sees the blood of Jesus. And that is great news and that's something to celebrate. So this week as you do your online learning, your virtual learning, um, your distance learning, however you want to, to call it, as you're doing those things and reading, remember every book you read um, should make you think of Jesus. Even though it might not be about Jesus, but the power of restoration is important. So maybe just like Elena, if she's borrowing books to read this week, um, and they're a gift from somebody else, um, I would encourage you to remember restoration and remember how we can repurpose something for a new home, for a new purpose, for a new calling. Um, but most importantly, Jesus restores our soul. 
and that's something to celebrate this morning. So let's go ahead and bow in prayer um, as we go throughout our service to remember Jesus is the ultimate restorer. Okay. Father God, I come to you now and I thank you um, for the freedom and the opportunity to read. Um, what, what a sweet gift that you've given us to be able to learn, to be able to interpret um, scripture, to be able to interpret and understand uh, words and knowledge um, to grow our mind because you've given us the ability to do so. Um, thank you for that gift. Help us just to use it to glorify you and not of our own doing, but God, but making your name known through the information we learn um, that it is sound, that it is um, God breathed and of scripture. Um, and I pray, God, that we would go throughout this week knowing and celebrating the fact that you restore our soul. Um, when we are a follower of Jesus Christ, we should leave, live each day um, in, a, in a celebration of restoration. We thank you for that truth in your name. Amen. Let's continue in worship. gave us so much that we should give back to continue the mission of his church. Now we want to take that time in our worship service to give you an opportunity to do that. You can go online uh, to the link that's below, or you can mail a check into the church office, or even drop a check in the locked mailbox there at the church. The most important thing is to not just receive from God, but more importantly we want to give back and worship God by giving. Dear God, thank you for loving us first and showing us what it takes to love others. Lord, pray that you'll bless the money that's given. Lord, use it to, uh, to further your kingdom and to bless our community. Lord, most of all, thank you for Jesus and for what he did on Easter. Lord, for his death and for his resurrection. And we ask all these things in his name. church. I hope and pray that you're all doing well uh, during these days. I know that we're all experiencing the effects of the virus and the social distancing that is involved, but we're all experiencing this in a little bit different way. 
I know that as we pray for those on the front lines of fighting this virus and uh, making important decisions and, of course, those directly impacted by this, uh, that we're also praying for each other. I want you to know that my family and I are praying for you, and uh, we know and trust that you are praying for us as well as we make final preparations uh, to head to the Ozarks in just uh, a few short weeks. We're excited about the future uh, together with you, uh, excited for whenever the day is when we can uh, meet together and, and meet you and, and you meet uh, my family and me. Uh, we look forward uh, to that day. If you have your Bible with you this morning, you can go ahead and open that up to Luke chapter 24. I've asked uh, our son Miles to read our scripture reading this morning, but before he does that, let's pray together. God, we are thankful for this day and for the ability to gather for worship this morning. We thank you for all of the blessings that you bestow upon us, for the ways you take care of us, Lord, for the ways you bless our lives. We thank you for the blessing of being able to worship this morning. And as we worship this morning, we pray that we are doing that in spirit and in truth, that we are lifting high the name of Jesus, and and that as we continue uh, with worship this morning, as we dig into your word, that we would continue to lift high the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Today we will be reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? <clears throat> they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. For the last few years, my family and I have lived in Mineral Wells, a small town about 45 miles west of Fort Worth. It was a popular tourist destination in the late 1800s and even into the 20th century. It was made famous by what is still known and operated uh, today as crazy water, a water full of minerals that supposedly will cure what ails you if you drink it or bathe in it or swim in it or mix your favorite soda water flavor with it. Today, after all these years, after the mineral water craze, when you drive in to this small town from just about any direction, towering over everything else, you will see a 14-story Spanish uh, colonial-style hotel. The Baker Hotel opened on November 22nd, 1929, just a few short weeks after the stock market crash that would begin the Great Depression. 
but that didn't slow the hotel down. Movie stars and celebrities like Clark Gable and Judy Garland, Will Rogers and Ronald Reagan, long before he was a politician, all stayed there. The hotel had two ballrooms, one of them on the 10th floor, the cloud room that took up the entire 10th floor. It was the first hotel in Texas with a swimming pool, and it was, of course, too, full of that same crazy water. Annual political conventions were held there. Long story short, it was a happening place. It was a popular place. It was doing booming business. But by 1972, the doors were shut, and the place was abandoned. It sat vacant for decades, becoming a home to hundreds of bats and looters and ghost tours. But as you might already imagine with today's sermon title, that's not the end of the story. Currently, we are one year into a three-year restoration uh, project that is going on at the Baker Hotel. $64 million investors are spending on bringing it back to life. You can probably imagine that today's sermon isn't a history lesson on small Texas towns or on hotel restoration. It's a sermon on the nature of God and God's work in the world. It's about God's restorative work in the world and how he invites us not only to experience that, but as believers and as disciples to play a part in his restorative work in the world around us. In our passage of scripture that Miles read a moment ago, we are introduced to some other disciples that are not part of the 12, now 11 of course, that we read about so much in the Gospels. But we know as we read the Gospels that there are other disciples besides those 12. The women that go to the tomb on the morning of the resurrection, Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and others are in that group of other disciples that we don't have an exact number for or know nearly as much about. And specifically, these two disciples that we meet on this day, we really don't know anything about except that one of them is named Cleopas. Of course, in the first part of the story, these two disciples have no idea who Jesus is when he approaches them. He clearly must have had normal human features. They make no note that he is any different than any other traveler that they might meet. In other words, Jesus doesn't show up as superhuman. And they didn't catch on to his identity when he interpreted Moses and all the prophets concerning himself. They are aware, of course, of the recent events in Jerusalem. And amusingly, they even tell Jesus about Jesus, describing the short version of Jesus' story. A, a prophet, mighty in word and deed, they talk about his cross and his death. It's in the second part of the story that the identity and the significance of the stranger becomes known to those travelers. They are gathered at the table, and as their guest takes the bread, and as their guest blesses the bread, as their guest breaks the bread and gives it to them, the symbolism pointing back to that upper room certainly seems to be intentional by Jesus. And it is in that that these two disciples are enlightened, like scales falling from their eyes, and they know who is there with them. Then they recall that their hearts, the way they put it, burned within them while he had been teaching them concerning the Messiah on the road to Emmaus. The story, of course, ends with the two men going to Jerusalem to report what had happened and to hear further testimony about the empty tomb and Peter having had a similar encounter with Jesus. So you're probably wondering, what in the world does all this have to do with the restorative work of God and his invitation for us to experience and to participate in that work. Well, I'm glad you asked. The disciples' lives, we know, have been shattered in ways they probably could not have imagined possible just a few days before. And here on Easter morning, in fact, the Lord is restoring that which they thought was lost and that which they thought was gone. First and foremost, Jesus meets us where we are at. Have you ever felt like you just needed to get away? There's probably lots of us feeling like that these days, uh, being stuck in the house, and even if we get out of the house, there's very few places to go. 
Or maybe you felt before or even right now that life had just thrown maybe just a little more or maybe even a lot more than you could handle. I think we've all probably felt that urge to just get away. Maybe we were deeply disappointed or living with unmet expectations or like our world had been turned upside down. Maybe those things caused us to wrestle with big questions. Who am I now in light of all of this? What's next? Where do I go from here? What do, what do I do? Can you remember a time in your life when you tried to do everything right and life still didn't work out the way that you planned or that you wanted? Or a time when you grieved the death of a loved one or the death of a dream or the death of a future that you thought would happen? Has your life ever been shattered, so to speak. If so, then you know what it is like to be Cleopas and his companion, whatever his name is, on that day on the road to Emmaus. It's Easter morning and the disciples are leaving Jerusalem. And honestly, why would they not leave Jerusalem? Who can blame them? Jerusalem is a place of pain and, and sorrow and loss. It's a place of death, of unmet expectations and disappointment. And as they walk along the road, they talk about the things that happened. And human nature tells us that they probably talked about the things that didn't happen. They talk about the rumors that Jesus was alive, but that sounded nothing more than the gossip grapevine making something out of nothing. We don't know exactly why they chose to go to Emmaus that day, but maybe, just maybe, any place was better than where they had been. And that's exactly where Jesus met them. See, the first thing about restoration is that Jesus meets us exactly where we're at. He doesn't wait for us to clean ourselves up enough or for us to know enough or for us to restore ourselves enough or anything else enough. He meets us where we're at. He met Saul on the road to Damascus in all of his zealous religious anger. He met Zacchaeus in his repentant, unjust plenty. He met the thief on the cross and his repentant end of life experience. But it's not just the stories of the Gospels. He met me exactly where I was at. He met you exactly where you were at. And although he, he meets us exactly where we're at, he doesn't leave us there. He loves us too much for that. And we shouldn't stay there. We live in light of the new creation that God is making us. We're just a few weeks away now from moving to our new home near Springfield. We're excited about that. But what if after we move there and after we've sold our home here in Mineral Wells, I just decided to drive back here to Mineral Wells one, one night in May and decide that because this used to be my house, I'm going to stay the night here again. It wouldn't work, right? Of course not. We all agreed that that would be crazy, but we all struggle at times, to not live in the past. And that's true for us as people. Sometimes the voice of the evil one reminds us of our failures and our mistakes, and we forget about the redemption that we've experienced in Jesus. We forget that Jesus already paid the price, that we've already been forgiven. And instead of living in freedom and in joy, we live in a place of fear and in condemnation. But as Jesus says in John 3, he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. So that's true for us as people, but it's also true for us as a church too. It's very easy for us to live in what used to be, or what used to work, or what used to minister to people in the community. But in the same way that Jesus moves us along as individual followers, as individual disciples, he does the same for us as a church too calling us to new things, calling us to new ways of ministering, calling us to minister to new people, calling us to new ways of communicating the gospel, new ways of growing together and participating in the kingdom of God. And if we only live in what was, we will miss out on the exciting and fruitful future that the Lord has for us. I'm thankful that Jesus doesn't leave us where we were when we met him. We participate in that work, of course, that he's doing within us. And as that happens, we grow and we leave those old ways of being behind. 
as the Apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. That was true for those disciples on the road to Emmaus too. We don't really know what they were headed to Emmaus for, but what we do know is, is that their encounter with Jesus ignited their spirits, or maybe the right way to put that is reignited their spirits, reignited their love for the Lord and moved them to not just go back to an old way of being before they knew Jesus, but to grow and to follow him in new ways, even though he wasn't around in the same way that he had always been before, to follow him in new ways. So he meets us where we're at, but he doesn't leave us there. He is restoring us. He is a restorative God. But sometimes restoration, well, it may not look exactly like we think it should. We live in a world of expectations. We have expectations for ourselves. We have expectations for other people. Other people have expectations for us. And sometimes we have expectations about what restoration is going to look like in our lives or maybe in the life of our church, or maybe in the life of another person. Maybe the way that God will do his restorative work in our lives, or in our relationships, or in the life of our church, or even in our post-COVID-19 world, sometimes those expectations we have don't match what actually occurs. And I imagine if asked ahead of time, the disciples on the road to Emmaus would never have written the script the way that Jesus did. Just like scripture says, God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And very often God works in unexpected ways. I wonder if you've ever prayed and told God, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm praying for this. And by the way, God, it would be tremendous if you could do this and this and this. And, and you did it exactly like this as if we need to tell God how he should go about fulfilling our prayer requests. And then God answers our prayer, but he does it in unexpected ways that never even crossed our mind, that never even crossed our mind in our wildest imagination, and yet God made it happen. God's restorative work in the world and even in our own lives and in the life of the church happen in unexpected ways, and we shouldn't be surprised when God does things differently than Maybe we have it figured out in our mind. Don't be surprised when it doesn't look exactly like what we thought it might. So not only does God do restorative work in us, we know that he does, but he invites us to join in that restoration. God in his holiness and power and all the other adjectives invites us to join him in his work in the world. Not only can we experience restoration as we follow Jesus in faith and as, and, and as we grow as his disciples, but he invites us to be ministers of restoration in the world. Continuing on in that verse from 2 Corinthians, Paul puts it this way, and he has committed us to the work of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Isn't it amazing that the God of the universe wants to use me? That he wants to use you to minister to others, to grow his kingdom, to bring reconciliation and restoration into the world. And so when we pray for others, when we listen to them, and when we show compassion, when we feed the hungry, when we shelter the shelterless, when we encourage someone, when we walk with them in their grief, when we tell them about the hope that is found in Jesus, when we share the good news of Jesus, when we share the beauty of the gifts of God that he has given us, when we share those with the world around us, we are participating in God's work of restoration in the world. There are, of course, ways we do this corporately as a church, but when the kingdom of God is at its strongest, when revival happens in churches and in communities, when people are on fire, or as the disciples that day had a, had a reigniting of something within their hearts, when they felt their hearts burning within them, 
When that happens, when people have a reignited passion for the Lord, it is when people join in personally in the work of restoration. Not simply on Sunday, not simply on Wednesday, not simply through the church's ministries, but in the everyday, through the relationships that they already have, through the connections and the neighbors and the, and, and the gifts that God has given them and the things that are already going on in their lives. So God has already given us relationships with people around us. God has already given us gifts. God has already uh, provided ways for us to take part in his restorative work in the world. And he invites us to be a part of that, to take advantage of all of those things for his glory and for the sake of his kingdom. Join in the restorative work of God. And last but not least, celebrate restoration. You know, the Baker Hotel is supposed to be done with its restoration, I think in 2022 or maybe 2023, somewhere in that range. And I'm certain that when it is completed, that they are going to celebrate with a texas size shindig. When restoration occurs, we should, we should celebrate. We should celebrate. Someone following Christ in baptism isn't a time to be somber. It's a time to rejoice and to celebrate. Someone experiencing new life in Christ is something to throw a party for. I remember well in the very first church that I served as pastor, there was a man named Benny. Benny had a joyful heart, but Benny, like all of us, had a past. Benny struggled with drug addiction and alcohol abuse. You know, any day at church is a, is a great day, but, but some days are just a little bit different. Some days are just a little bit better. And I remember this one particular Sunday, it had just been one of those days that's a little bit better. A great day of worship, but slightly longer than usual. And we were near the end of the worship service. In fact, I was trying to wrap things up. We had already had a time of invitation. I was trying to let people leave. And out of nowhere, here comes Benny coming up behind me because he had been in the choir, surprising me. And I remember this moment of being perturbed by that. Like, what in the world is it now? I need to wrap this up. And Benny said, Nolan, I just want to tell everyone and thank God that I am totally clean now for two years. And I remember it feeling like God had lovingly body slammed my spirit of hurry up and meet people's time expectations and said, celebrate this man's restoration. Celebrate my work in this man. I love the story of the prodigal son. You know it well. When the son returns and this wonderful moment of restoration happens, illustrating the heart of the restoration of God, what does the father do? He throws a party. He throws a party. If we know Jesus, we are restored. We are being restored. And we have the invitation to participate in that restoration. And when it happens and when we see it, let's rejoice. And let's throw a party in celebration of the amazing God of restoration. Would you pray with me? God, we are so thankful that you are a God of restoration. You are a God who meets us exactly where we are at. But we know that you don't leave us there. You invite us to participate in the restorative work that you do within us. And then you invite us to participate in your restorative work in the world. You invite us to minister to others, to listen to them, to serve them, to pray for them, to encourage them, to walk with them through all of life's ups and downs and sideways. We thank you for the amazing God that you are and we pray that we would not only participate in this work of restoration that you are continuing to do in all of us, but that we would share this restorative work with the world around us, that we would use the relationships we have, the connections we have, the gifts you've given us, to share your restorative work with the world and with the people around us. And that when that happens, when, when restoration is experienced, 
that we would celebrate what has happened. We thank you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know this isn't a normal sort of invitation and response time, as if we were able to meet together to worship in the sanctuary. But we can respond. We can be invited to respond from wherever we are worshiping from this morning. Maybe as we've read these words of Scripture, as we've reflected on them, maybe God is doing a restorative work in your heart. Maybe today you feel like you need to respond to that restorative work. Maybe for the very first time, I hope that you'll share that with us. Maybe this morning, that restorative work, that, that, that reigniting of passion within your heart has happened. And you want to share that with somebody and you want somebody to pray with you along those lines. We would love to do that. Maybe today, as we've thought about these things, you've thought about your own gifts and your own connections, your own friendships and relationships with the people around you. And you've thought about people that you can pray for. Maybe people that are desperate for a restorative work in their own life. I hope that you'll take this time to maybe not only join in in singing, but to also respond to whatever the Lord is doing in your heart this morning.